No one gets a pass on facing uh, the most important and significant realities of life, especially the reality of death. And every day, you and I are living in uh, what you think and the way that you think about these realities. It actually doesn't matter if you are a churched person or an unchurched person. It doesn't matter if you're spiritual or not spiritual, religious or not religious, Christian or non-Christian. Each of us are operating every single day according to the realities of life and what we think about these things. This past week, I was able to spend some time up in uh, Raleigh, Durham with uh, the group of churches that we're a part of. It's called the Summit Collaborative. And we were there for a few days and hanging out with um, all of our friends and uh, those who have been planting churches all over um, uh, of the world, really. And while I was there, um, um, I, I, I passed on the way home a, an area that reminded me of some family friends, some longtime family friends who have recently passed away. Um, I, I, w- I was uh, great friends with um, a pastor named Larry Upchurch who pastored for um, decades in, in that area. And then one of uh, my family friends, uh, uh, a man by the name of Ray Hoban that I grew up uh, going fishing with like as, as far back as I could remember. And this week, for whatever reason, as I was driving past this, this area, thinking about them, both of them have died recently, either in the past few months or not long ago. And it was kind of sobering for me um, as I thought about them uh, being gone. And you see, the longer that you live, it seems the more um, sober you are to uh, the realities of a life. And personally, um, I hate the reality of death. Can I get a witness in the room? Any, anybody agree with me on that one? It's a reality of, of our lives. It's probably the most significant of all. And it's, it's one of these realities for us that's just absolutely inescapable. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or how old you are, how young you are, or what your situation is. It's totally inescapable. It's one of the most certain things about life, which is death. But today in our story, in the story of Exodus, we we have to come face to face with the tragedy of death, but we're also provided great hope. And so the title for today is this, Something Has to Die. Something has to die. If you've got a Bible, I'd love for you to join me in the book of Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus chapter um, 13 today, and I'm going to begin, or, or Exodus 11 rather, 11, we're going to look at chapters 11, 12, and 13, and I'm going to walk you through these um, of chapters and parts of this story. It's one of the most significant um, events in the entire Bible. It's what's called Passover, and Passover would become one of the major feasts of God's people that they would then celebrate year after after year, and I actually didn't plan it this way at the beginning of the year when I was uh, planning this out, but in God's providence, we're actually in the middle of Passover week right now, which is kind of crazy and a little, little bit like, like mysterious. And in God's providence, Passover started this past week. It'll end in a couple days. And the story that we're covering today in the book of Exodus happens to be um, Passover. So let me catch you up a little bit on the context of what's happening. Hundreds of years before the time of Christ, God's people are in a land named Egypt. They had actually forfeited their land, the promised land, the land that God had sent Abraham to in which God would build a great nation through them. They ended up in Egypt and now it's been hundreds of years, and they're under the rule and the reign of a ruthless tyrant named Pharaoh, which is his title, and you should really think of him as an ancient Hitler. It was absolutely atrocious, the things that were happening in the way that he was treating God's people, the slavery, the the oppression, the killing, the literal murdering of children. And God's people are crying out to him, and God raises up a prophet, the most unlikely person, who comes and is God's representative and is God's prophet who he sends on behalf of the people to go and confront Pharaoh himself. God would then issue 10 plagues, nine of which we covered last week, and today we'll cover number 10. Douglas Stewart, who's one of the premier commentators on the book of Exodus, he says that these plagues are kind of building in intensity. So the first um, three plagues, plagues one, two, and three, the Nile turned to blood, the frogs and the gnats, were relatively brief in their duration. They did not cause any death, and they affected people's, um, mainly people's patience and convenience, though they were certainly severe. 
plagues four, five, and six, the flies, the death of the livestock, and the, the boils on the skin were much more harmful. They killed off many livestock. There was serious disease among humans. And these uh, plagues were, um, they didn't result in the release of God's people, but continued to develop a significant amount of resistance among the Pharaoh. Then the seventh, eighth, and ninth plagues, the hail, the locusts, and the darkness were even more severe than the the ones prior, and they resulted in the destruction of both animals and crops. The locusts ruined what the crops that had remained, and the darkness plague was so frightening and debilitating that a three-day period of duration, Pharaoh was actually willing at first to allow the Israelites to depart, only if they would leave their animals behind as a surety of their eventual return. Now, although the plagues built in intensity, the increase was not equally incremental. There was a, Stuart says, a quantum leap in the severity to the culmination of all the plagues in the 10th plague, this 10th judgment, which actually launched the exodus and which was seen as a supreme act of judgment against Egypt. And it says, particularly against the gods of Egypt. This is where the story picks up in Exodus chapter 11, beginning in verse four, it says this. So Moses said, he's confronting Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. Commentators would tell us that midnight here represents the darkest point of the night. And then we would see that God is going to require the firstborn He's going to kill the firstborn of every household in the entire land of Egypt. The firstborn here is, there's so much symbolism here, and there's so much that this represents, but in the Old Testament, specifically in the understanding of God's people, the firstborn, and even in ancient culture, would have been representative, would have represented an entire house, would have represented an entire people, and it was common that God would require the firstborn as the requirement or the obligation that was due. God. You would see this even in the way that we give and that we have offerings, this concept of the first fruits, that the first belongs to God. And God is going to um, require uh, the life of the firstborn in every home, but with one uh, possible um, way of escape. Look in verse 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of of Egypt, this idea of God multiplying his people, multiplying his greatness, multiplying his wonders. Verse 10, Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his hand. If you jump to chapter 12, verse three, it says this, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Now, here we begin to see a provision that God is going to offer in uh, as an option, an optional way, a means of escape from the death of the firstborn. Here we see in verse 3 that God is going to issue to the people of Israel a new calendaring system. And the entire future of God's people for the next several decades is going to be God reorienting them as his new people, as a new way of living and thinking. Here we see God begins with a new calendaring system, a whole new way to think about their year. This is going to be a new identity. This is going to be a new people. And God says that this is going to begin the first month of the year and you're going to take a lamb. You're going to take a a lamb. This would have been a, a sheep. This would have been a small animal. And you're going to take it on the 10th day of the month and you're going to take one lamb per home. It says this in verse five. Your lamb shall be without blemish a male a year old, verse six, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Here what we're seeing is a selection process. This lamb is going to be required to not have any blemishes, not to have any impurities. This lamb is supposed to represent um, purity and holiness, and it is going to be a male, It has to be a male and it has to be one year old. You think one year old as like, man, this is just a baby little lamb. 
No, actually, at one year old, a, a male would have reached, or a lamb rather, would have reached the stage of adulthood, would have been prepared, would have actually been ready to be um, received. And then you're going to see an examination process. The lamb is selected on the 10th day, but they're supposed to keep it in their home or around their home for the next several days, which would have signified kind of an examination process, really a waiting period before the lamb would be slaughtered. And then on that day, you would kill the lamb, you would slay the lamb, slaughter the lamb, and the slaughtering process would have been either cutting the throat of the lamb or striking the head of the lamb so that it is, um, it, it is dead. And then we see this in verse 7. Very encouraging story, by the way. Can I, everybody liking this? It's crazy. Verse 7. Then they shall take some of the blood, and it gets crazy, and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. You're supposed to, once you slay this lamb and slaughter it, you're supposed to take the blood and take hyssop and dip it into the blood and then swipe the entryway of your door, the post above and the post on the side with um, blood. Imagine if you did that this afternoon in your neighborhood. It would be a little bit odd. This is supposed to be odd. This is supposed to be a, a sign. And then you're supposed to take the lamb. You're supposed to eat it. You're supposed to consume it. You're supposed to roast it on the fire. There were actually provisions or prohibitions rather where you could not eat it raw or boiled. It had to be cooked over the fire, which is a symbol. And then you had to take the unleavened bread, a bread that did not have yeast in it yet. A, 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 yeast is something that you would take from the previous um, lump of dough and you would put it into the new one and it would um, actually begin a decaying process which would cause the dough to rise. And you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to take this bread completely unleavened and you're supposed to take bitter herbs Herbs that would, think of like horseradish, something that would uh, feel and that would, that, that would taste bitter, which is going to remind them of the affliction and the suffering that they have endured. And then it says this in verse 11. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Verse 13. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This meal was supposed to be eaten in haste, in a hurry. They were supposed to be ready to leave. This isn't kind of like lounging around, having a good time. They were supposed to be dressed. They were supposed to be ready to exit. They were supposed to be ready to leave the land. And then in the night, God would strike the firstborn, man and beast. And then on all the gods of Egypt, God would demonstrate his judgment, which was God's judgment against idolatry in the land. And if there's blood on the door, if you have the sign, the blood will be like a covering over your home. If you have faith to believe what God has said, he will see the blood and he will cover, he will pass over that house and those in that home will be protected from death, specifically the firstborn. And then it says this in verse 29. And at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, and he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. As you read the story, and as you kind of cover the intensity of this moment, if you can only imagine an, an entire nation, an entire group of people in the middle of the night wailing and and crying, loud cries. Scripture says that wailing like you would never even experience ever again in humanity, in the history of humanity. It's interesting that commentators point out that the crying, the wailing has now shifted. It was God's people who were crying out. They were in oppression. They were slaves and they were being beaten and they were crying for God and his help, but now the crying has, has shifted it has shifted to the Egyptians who are crying out. 
And because of the terror of that moment, Pharaoh rushes the people of God out of the land. And the text would tell us that people, the people of God would actually ask the Egyptians for things like silver and, and gold and jewelry and clothing, and they would give them all of these riches and all of these possessions. And the Egyptians gave them everything that they asked it for because of the favor of God. It says that they plundered the Egyptians, which is why we're going to see later in the book how they ended up with all the stuff that they had. And then it says this in verse 37 of chapter 12. And the people of Israel, they journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. They left the land, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them and very much livestock with flocks and herds. We now see God's people leaving Egypt. The exodus has begun. They're now leaving, and there's a great multitude. We don't know exactly how many people. Commentators actually debate on the official number, but we see a great multitude of people, and the text tells us that it's a mixed multitude. We'll see this later on in the book, but there are most likely others from other nations and the nation of Egypt, those who have now converted to God's people because they've seen the work of God and the move of God, and now we see those who are even of different nations and ethnicities now along with God's people, and it's a mixed multitude. In chapter 13, verse 18, it says this, but God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea, and the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Verse 21, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. I'd like to point out three um, kind of major themes that I think are important for us to understand from this um, section that I think will have significant um, implication and revel re relevance for our lives. Here's the first one. The, the first one is the priority of the heart. The priority of the heart. We, we see here that um, God is in opposition with Pharaoh and there's something off about Pharaoh's heart. His heart is the, it's the inner man. The word here is, it can be translated as the will or, or the mind or, or the inner self, the inner person. It's the center of who someone is. And we see that the center of this leader, Pharaoh, is not good. It's actually tyrannical. And there's a hardness, there's an unwillingness to change, there's a stubbornness, a rebelliousness, a rigidity that is true about Pharaoh's heart, and God is allowing the tyrant here to have freedom of will, to have the kind of heart that he wants to have. Now, it says, um, uh, best I can tell, about 20 times in the book of Exodus that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now, it's interesting, the original King James uses the, ver the, the word harden, uh, but, but there's actually three different Hebrew terms that are used in this section. 12 times the word is used that is strengthened, or Pharaoh's heart was caused to grow strong or to be strengthened. Seven times it says it uses the word for heaviness or heavy oppression that his heart, God allowed his heart to grow heavier. And then one time it is the word for hardness or severity or, or fierce. Here's what I think God is doing and what, what some would say as well, that God is actually strengthening Pharaoh's heart. He's allowing him to become more of what he already was. He, he was allowing the most full version of Pharaoh, of Pharaoh's heart, to become reality, which is actually what Pharaoh desired himself. And so here's, here's kind of a, I think an important thing that you have to recognize about your own heart and my own heart and, and even the way that God allows our heart to become things. What Pharaoh desired to become, God allowed. He allowed. God, by, and, and God hardening Pharaoh's heart is in a sense allowing Pharaoh to experience the full potential outcome of his opposition against God. So here's, here's kind of my, full, my first kind of like, like, like main takeaway is this. If you oppose God, he will allow you to experience the full consequences of that opposition. You have to recognize that, that, that God is a ruler, as we're going to see, that he's, he's in control, but he gives you free will. He actually allows you to lead your own heart. He, he allows you to become what you want to become, and he allows you to even experience the full potential and the full outcome of whatever your heart is. He is God. And we have a tendency to kind of forget that and, 
And we kind of have a tendency to forget that, that God will be God, that he rules, that he controls all things. And, and here we see that, that God is actually, by strengthening Pharaoh's heart, he's, he's in a sense allowing Pharaoh to become something that will demonstrate and reveal God's power in the future through these plagues. And if Pharaoh immediately succumbs to what God want, is, is doing, then it doesn't demonstrate God's power in the same way. And I love what one commentator says. It says that the idea that Yahweh could do whatever he wanted with Pharaoh's heart and specifically could harden it, therefore, was both an evidence of Yahweh's control of all things, including the mightiest monarch of the day, and also evidence that Yahweh had done what the Egyptians thought the gods would usually do, weigh the heart and decide whether its owner was worthy of eternal life or not. In effect, then, each time Yahweh is described as hardening Pharaoh's heart, the alert reader is reminded that Yahweh had, as it were, weighed Pharaoh and found him wanting. And so here's what we we have to recognize. You you see these judgments, you, you see these plagues, you see that God is even ruling over Pharaoh, the most powerful powerful person, the most powerful force in the world. It reminds us of, of this truth that God rules over every inch of the cosmos, even the heart of man. He rules over it it all. He's he's the great ruler. He's the great controller. He's the controller of hearts. He's the controller of kings. He's the controller of animals, of atmosphere, of rivers, of geography. There is nothing he cannot control. And God brought about these plagues with a, a structure to them in a sense, and in a specific sense, these plagues were designed to hammer home to the Egyptians that God is firmly in control of the entire process, from the water in the river to the flies in the air to the lightning in the sky to the darkness in the air, that God is the controller of it all, and he is to be admired and worshiped over their pantheism and their other following of God's. And Solomon would, would share, share this with us in Proverbs 21.1. He would say, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. So I just, I just have to kind of stop today and a little bit of a heavy sermon today. But I just have to, to stop and, and kind of ask the question of where is your heart today? Where is your heart today? The reality is that you, if you resist God and if you oppose him in your heart, you will experience the full consequences of that decision. But if you turn to him, if you have a heart that is receptive, if you have a heart that is receiving, that, that, that God meets you there and God begins to do the work inside you and even leading your own heart, where is your heart today? We, we see the, the priority, priority of the heart. And then here's number two. Here's the second thing we see. The devastation of sin. To just the utter devastation of sin. This story is so heavy. I mean, it's so unbelievably tragic. I mean, not just death, but there is a death here on a level that is pervasive. It covers every home in, in, in Egypt. And here we are allowed to see in, in this story the, the full conclusion, the full re- result, the full outcome of of sin and what this produces in in people, in humanity, in in the world. And and so I'll say it this way. The end result of sin is death. It produces death. It doesn't produce life. It doesn't produce goodness. It doesn't produce a better income. It doesn't produce a better family. It doesn't produce better health. In the end, sin always produces death. And this lifestyle of this Pharaoh had finally caught up with him. And the Egyptians also, that they are now experiencing the devastation and the destruction of their their sin, that there is great devastation and destruction here. And we would see in Romans 6.23, Paul would tell us for the the wages or the the price, the, the payment, the income, the result, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The great penalty of sin or the great tragedy of sin, and though it might be enjoyed for a season, in the end, it it produces devastation. It produces death. And and every time we choose to sin, we're choosing devastation to something. We're we're essentially choosing whatever is around us to, to have devastation. And 
Sin is the fragmentation. It's the unraveling of, of shalom and health, which is why unrighteousness is the word that's used for sin because it's making things unright. Sin is spiraling things out of right relationship, and, and in the end, sin catches up with you, which teaches us this, is that no one escapes the devastation of sin. No one escapes it. No one's above it. No one's outside it. No one, no one, gets, no one gets a pass. No, no, no one gets a different line. We see the Egyptians got away with their tyranny and oppression for a season, but not in the end. It's inescapable. Why? It's because God is actually just. God is just. He, he, won't, intol- he, he won't tolerate in, injustice. And the consequences of, of sin, they, they affected everyone in, in the nation, they affected all of them. It's, it's explicit here that no home escaped from the prince to the peasant, from the king to the slave girl, from the throne to the judge, the, the dungeon rather. Everyone experienced the consequences of this sin. And it shows us that sin is not about a class thing. It's not about a race thing or an ethnic thing. It's not about an age thing. It's not about a nationality thing. It's a human thing. And, and so, so this story give, gives us a very tangible, visible demonstration of the devastation of sin. And so I have to ask you the question today is, what is your relationship with sin right now? What is your relationship with it? It, it? Is it something that you enjoy? Is it something that you pursue? Is it something that you tolerate? Is it something that you endure and allow? Or is it something that you fight and that you uh, resist and the reality is that whatever you, whenever you allow sin to endure and persist in your life, it's going to produce destruction and devastation in that area and that thing. So we see the priority of the heart, and then we see the devastation of sin. And here's the third thing that we see is the provision of a sacrifice. The provision of a sacrifice. It's, I think it's important to note here is that um, the death of the firstborn was not just something that was going to happen to Egypt and Egyptians. It was also going to happen to Israel. This is signifying that Israel, in many ways, is really no better. Both the Egyptians and the Israelites, though different, obviously, had the same problem. They are both under sin. They, they both fail to worship God as he deserves. They both follow idols and false gods. And we'll even see this in the wilderness, that God's people are not like some kind of shining light of amazing purity in the wilderness. They're not some kind of like awesomely devoted worshipers to God. No, at every turn, they're rebelling. They're resisting submission and worship to God. And this demonstrates that all humanity is in need. Even Israel doesn't get a pass. Humanity is inescapable of um, or, or incapable, rather, of their own deliverance. And deliverance doesn't come from the inside, it comes from the outside. And they're desperate for God to show up, for God to make deliverance happen, for him to make a, a way, and, and, and they're desperate. And the, the, the Israelites can't, can't even deliver themselves. They're not any better than, than Egypt. They're not somehow going to get a pass because of who they are, or because of their national identity. They're in the same Boat, but here's what we see about the, the love of God and the power of God, specifically to his covenant people, is this, is that God always makes a way. God always makes a way. And we're gonna see this throughout the entire story is that they didn't deserve to have a way. They didn't z- deserve to have a way out. They, they didn't deserve because of their, their lifestyle and the way that they had acted to be, to, to have rescue, to have redemption, to have forgiveness. But God makes a way, not because of them, but because of his own covenant love for them. And he makes a provision he makes a way, he, he, he makes a sacrifice. He's going to bring redemption to his people and the way that he's going to do it is through the sacrifice of a lamb. And blood is going to be spilled so that their blood is not. And here's, here's the brutal reality is that in order for them to be de- delivered, in order, it's, it's, it's interesting to me. God doesn't just like, you know, snap his fingers and be like, okay, you guys go, you, you be set free. God, God doesn't be like, you know what? Um, I'm just gonna wave a magic wand and then like everything's gonna be fine and you're gonna be gone. No, no the way that it happens, like the, the way that deliverance is actually produced is because of death. So, so, so it's death that's actually the necessity for deliverance. So I'll say it this way. It took death to produce deliverance. 
it, it took death to produce deliverance, and deliverance was secured and enabled and only possible because of death. And to get out, for God's people to be set free, something had to die. Something has to die. And freedom couldn't happen until death. Deliverance couldn't happen until death. Exodus couldn't happen until death. Death is the means, it's the vehicle for deliverance, which means something had to die. And here's what we're going to see about this story. And it's funny, as I have conversations with, with some of you and as I do more studying, and I've, I've been loving this, this book so far, and it's, it's amazing. Everything that I study, it's like, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't see that. I, I, I learned more and more. The more that I, I talk with um, our, our friends who have a Messianic background or who are, are Jewish, the, the more that I, I'm like, oh, my, there's so much that I don't understand. I feel, like, I feel like as I study this, I feel like I understand about like 5% of what this book means. I mean, literally. I think, I think when we get to heaven, it's, it's just the unbelievable story and symbolism and it, it's just going to blow our minds. And here's what we see is that this whole moment, this whole situation, it's a shadow. It's a shadow. What, what, do, you, what do you know about a shadow? Well, I, I, have, I have a shadow kind of behind me and because of the lights and the shadow is, isn't me, right? Now it's representative of me. It's, it's kind of an extension of me, but, but the shadow isn't me. The, the shadow is actually pointing to me, the real thing. This story is a shadow that's pointing to something else that is more real, that's, that's, that's more true, that this whole Passover story, this, this whole lamb that was slain, this, the blood, the, the whole process, the whole, the whole exodus is a greater story and this is a shadow that's pointing to that. We would read this in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul would say, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. What we see here is that Christ is the lamb. He, he, he's, he's the one that is slain. He's the one that is, is killed and so that he might be received by all and by practicing this meal, they were practicing faith. Every moment of this process, they are hearing what Moses is telling them to do and they're believing in faith that it's actually going to work. Imagine if it didn't work. Imagine if it didn't work. The blood didn't work, the, the lamb didn't work, the meal didn't work, they're all ready to go. They got their shoes on, their, shoes on. They got their belt strapped, they got their, their staff in their hand. And, and imagine it doesn't happen and, and, and then the Egyptians are gonna come after them and they're gonna be done. This whole process is a process of faith, that they're trusting through this sacrifice that God was securing their protection from death and is going to produce deliverance in them from the oppression and from the slavery. We would see uh, uh, John in John 1.29 in, in the Gospels, when, when John and Jesus have this amazing encounter, it says this, the next day when he saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is basically saying, there he is. He's the lamb. He takes away the sin of the world. We would see in Isaiah 53, 7, we would see this, that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened it not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And we would see that God laid on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53 tells us. So here's what this whole story means. Here's what this whole episode is meaning. It's a shadow that's pointing you to Christ. It, it, it's a shadow that's trying to demonstrate to you something greater, something deeper, something more true, something more real about your own life and about your own Passover lamb in Christ. See, Christ was the selected lamb. He was selected as spotless and without blemish. He was sinless. He was the examined lamb. When he would, on Palm Sunday, enter the city of Jerusalem, he would enter a several day period of being tried, of being examined by the Jewish courts and the Roman courts. And not even Pilate himself could find fault in him. He was, even though he was falsely accused, he was found faultless. He was the selected lamb. He was the examined lamb. And then he was the slaughtered lamb. And Christ would be slain, he, he would be killed, he, he would literally be slaughtered and his blood would be spilled and his blood would cover the posts. And then he was also the substituted lamb. I never thought about this till recently in preparation for today, but 
Christ is our substitution. It's referred to as substitutionary atonement, meaning that Christ stands in your place. One of the ways that you could say it is Jesus in my place. Christ is the substituted lamb, but I never thought about this till this week, that the substitution is optional. Here's what I mean by that. It's optional. Uh, uh, God told um, the people to take the blood and to put it over the, the post, but it's optional. The substitution only covers those who have the blood on the door, the entryway to the home. And to those who are covered by the blood, the substitution is applied to them. And so we see by faith those who are in Christ. And this is the great mystery of salvation is that those who are in Christ through faith see Christ on the cross and in faith trust him as Lord. He is our Passover lamb. He is our great substitution. And then the the death, the angel of death comes to your home and passes over you because of the blood of Christ. He is our great Passover lamb. Let's pray. God, today, as we think about what Christ has done and the way that he has become our substitution, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to experience that and to trust that and to to know that in our own lives as well. And would you grant us the faith to um, believe, the faith to believe in who Christ is and what he has done. We ask this in Christ's name.